Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to tell you um, a couple of related stories that uh, revolve around this issue of, of secondary endosymbiosis. We uh, heard a great talk from Mike Gray last night, and he touched on some of the uh, aspects that I'm going to uh, address today, uh, which uh, helps me out immensely. Um, when we're talking about eukaryotes and eukaryotes, it's primarily, um, almost exclusively, uh, in the realm of, of photosynthesis. So uh, the, the organisms I'm going to talk about today are examples in which um, chloroplasts or plastids have moved uh, from one eukaryotic lineage to another, and that's kind of been the paradigm for how we think about secondary endosymbiosis. And, um, I'm going to uh, provide an overview of a system that we've been working in in my lab um, for a decade or so now, and then finish off by uh, touching on a new group of, of organisms um, that sit at the very opposite end of the uh, sort of spectrum between um, fully integrated organelle and sort of a, a quasi-transient um, into symbiont. So hopefully you'll see that these uh, two examples that I talk about today uh, provide some interesting perspectives on how we think about the complex ways that uh, eukaryotic cells are engaged in, in, in uh, symbiotic relationships with other eukaryotes. So as, uh, as we heard last night, uh, chloroplasts or plastids um, are one of the two uh, organelles of eukaryotic cells that are known to uh, be endosymbiotically derived. Uh, this cartoon that you see here is, is uh, meant to remind us of some of the, the salient features when we think about a, a bacterial cell that uh, entered into an a endosymbiotic relationship with a eukaryote. What uh, has taken place that now leads us to conclude that that endosymbiont is now a fully integrated organelle. Uh, this uh, cartoon shows a generic photosynthetic eukaryote, uh, an alga, um, as Mike told us last night, plastids are known to have uh, evolved from once free-living cyanobacteria. Uh, the exact number of genes that that endosymbiont had um, is not known, um, not particularly important. In, in, uh, in broad strokes, we can say at least 1,500 or so genes probably came in with the cyanobacterial progenitor of the plastid. Um, if we fast forward, uh, well, a billion years or so, uh, we come upon the modern day organisms um, like green plants and uh, red algae and, and so forth. Um, that cartoon, if you look at it, you can see that um, it has, uh, you know, your average primary plastid bearing alga would have uh, 70 to at most 200 genes in its um, organelle or genome. Um, of course, what has happened with the, the bulk of the genes that came in with the, the bacterial progenitor of the organelle, um, th those genes have either been lost uh, because they're no longer uh, needed in this particular context, or they've migrated to the nuclear genome of the um, host eukaryote, and that's uh, depicted in the bottom there. Of course, the, the organelle itself, the, the plastid, um, requires many more proteins um, for proper functioning than are encoded in the genome itself, and so um, an important part of this puzzle is the fact that uh, the many of those proteins that function in the organelle are, are uh, in the nuclear genome, as I said, they're expressed um, and they are uh, translated on cytosolic ribosomes, and those proteins are uh, imported back to the organelle um, from whence they whence they came. So that's kind of the, uh, in a nutshell, um, the basics of, of uh, primary endosymbiosis: movement of genes from. Um, the uh, endosymbiont slash organelle into the nucleus, and then the, the issue of developing a protein trafficking uh, system. So there are three main lines of primary plastid-bearing eukaryotes that are, are known today, the red algae, the green algae, and the, the glycocystophytes or glycophytes. Uh, the green algae, of course, are the lineage that gave rise to the, to the land plants from uh, single-celled green algal progenitors. But as we heard last night, um, things are rather more complicated than that. Uh, we have this issue of secondary endosymbiosis, and this is, again, a case in which a primary plastid-bearing eukaryote uh, is taken up by a non-photosynthetic uh, host eukaryote and, uh, given enough time, evolves into a permanent um, 
uh, organelle. There are a large number of different lineages that are known to have acquired photosynthesis by this, by this mechanism. Mike uh, described some of them last night. They're listed there. Um, for uh, our purposes today, I want you to, to keep in mind that there are uh, two, dis two distinct sources of secondary uh, uh, and the symbionts, in this particular case, we, we know of algae that have engulfed and assimilated red algal endosymbionts, and we know of, of uh, cases where uh, green algal uh, endosymbionts have been taken up and integrated. Uh, it, as if that weren't complicated enough, there are uh, examples of what are called tertiary endosymbioses. The dinoflagellate algae uh, are particularly uh, uh, adept at carrying out these higher order endosymbiotic events. Um, as you might be aware, we won't uh, dwell on those today. Um, I think many of the, the basic principles when we think about genome evolution in, in uh, nuclear uh, genomes in the context of these higher order endosymbioses, I think some of the principles are fundamentally the same between secondary and tertiary endosymbioses. So I'm going to uh, just be referring to secondary uh, events throughout the, the course of this talk. So. Uh, marrying those two general, uh, general points, um, I like to uh, think of the process of gene transfer in the context of endosymbiosis somewhat like this, where we have waves of endosymbiotic gene transfer. Initially in the context of primary endosymbiosis, we have genes that were uh, present in the cyanobacterial progenitor of the, of the plastid. Those genes um, migrate over to the nucleus uh, of the primary eukaryote. In the context of a secondary endosymbiotic event, we have uh, an additional wave of transfer. Uh, genes move from the uh, primary uh, nucleus to the nucleus of the secondary host. So this leads to a rather complex um, array of genes that are located in the nucleus of the, the secondary host, uh, especially, especially if we also include genes derived by uh, non-endosymbiotic gene transfer or horizontal gene transfer um, at various stages of uh, this sort of evolutionary trajectory. Okay, so the two lineages that we focus on in my own group uh, are interesting uh, for various reasons. Uh, the main one uh, for the purposes of today is that the nucleus of the eukaryote that was engulfed in the secondary endosymbiotic event uh, is retained in the form of a residual nucleus called a nucleomorph. This is uh, one of the two lineages. These are the chloracneophytes. Um, that word roughly means green spider for obvious reasons, I think. Uh, what you can see in this uh, cross-section through a cell is uh, the nucleus of the host. This here uh, that I'm pointing to is the chloroplast or plastid. And then nested between the inner and outer pairs of membranes around this uh, organelle is this uh, tiny uh, nucleomorph. So that's the, the chloracneophytes. Uh, their endosymbiont was a, a green alga, quite clearly. Uh, the second lineage of nucleomorph-bearing algae are the, uh, the cryptophytes, rather, and they have um, an endosymbiont and a nucleomorph uh, plastid derived from uh, a red algal cell. Now, uh, what's interesting about these types of cells is that they, uh, in addition to having the nucleomorph, if they have a, a nucleomorph which has a residual amount of DNA, then they also have a uh, residual cytoplasmic compartment, or PPC. So these uh, cells are very complex in nature. Um, they have four DNA-containing compartments and two distinct cytoplasmic compartments in which core eukaryotic cellular processes are taking place. Now, I'll just give you a whirlwind tour of uh, what we know about nucleomorph genome structure and content. Uh, there's six nucleomorph genomes that have been sequenced uh, over the years. Um, this is the first one that was done, a cryptophyte Giardia theta. Uh, this genome is about a half a megabase pair in size. Um, it has about 460-odd genes, and one of the interesting features about it uh, especially when compared to the chloracneophyte genomes, is, is the fact that it has uh, three small linear chromosomes with these subtelomeric ribosomal DNA uh, repeat units. Uh, this is a, a similar sort of diagram showing the chloracneophytes for comparison, um, three small chromosomes with the subtelomeric repeats. Now, this is interesting from, from uh, the perspective of where these 
two genomes come from. Chlor chloracnophytes have a green algal derived uh, nucleomorph and chloroplast, in, in cryptophytes was a red alga, and yet uh, these two systems have converged upon very similar uh, structural uh, features in terms of the, the, uh, the nature of their nucleomorph genomes. It's a very striking example of reductive, uh, compare, you know, convergent uh, reductive evolution of the genomes. Well, so the question of what do these nucleomorphs actually encode? Um, long story short, uh, there's only about 500 at most uh, genes in nucleomorph genomes, so they're obviously very limited uh, compared to the, the nucleus from which they, they are derived. Um, some of the take-home messages are, are that there is essentially no metabolic uh, capacities um, coded for by nucleomorph genomes, so the metabolism of these uh, residual uh, cytoplasms and these uh, residual eukaryotic cells nest nested against the plastid um, is, uh, th there's essentially no nothing of the primary metabolism left. The nucleomorph genomes primarily house uh, housekeeping genes, transcription, translation, things of that nature, uh, albeit uh, incomplete sets of uh, proteins involved in those, and very much so an incomplete set of genes uh, encoding pr proteins that are targeted to the plastid, so at most about 30 or so genes for plastid-targeted proteins, highly incomplete set. So uh, the, the, the question that, that uh, uh, it comes to mind when many people think about uh, the story of nucleomorphs um, is why are they there at all? Um, I, I told you some of the uh, other lineages of, of algae that are known to have acquired plastid secondarily, uh, and they do not have nucleomorphs. So in principle, uh, it is possible to lose all of the DNA in the, the endosymbiont nucleus, either uh, deleted outright or migrated over to the, the secondary host. Um, Tom Kevlar smith uh, described the fact that the, the optimum size of a nucleomorph genome was in fact zero, and, and by that he roughly meant that um, it would be better and simpler for the host cell simply to um, get rid of the, the nucleomorph entirely. Um, you wouldn't have to replicate all that DNA, and the reality is that as long as there's uh, even one essential gene for a plastid-targeted protein in the nucleomorph DNA, you need to retain um, uh, a whole host of transcription and translation factors uh, in, that, in that genome. So uh, it seems um, much simpler to get rid of nucleomorphs uh, altogether. It has happened in nature. Why hasn't it happened in these two groups? Well, so uh, we were inspired by that question and uh, a whole host of other questions to sequence the nuclear genomes of a model cryptophyte and a model chloracneophyte. Um, this cartoon summarizes uh, quite a number of years of work from my group, uh, the Keeling Lab, uh, Jeff McFadden's lab, the Gray Lab, and um, a handful of other groups around the, around the world. Um, what you can see in each case here is the number of genes that are encoded in those genomes. Uh, in particular, this study characterized the more than 20,000 genes encoded in the, uh, in the nuclear genomes. Um, so one of the interesting questions that uh, we wanted to address was the complexity of the, the biochemistry taking place in these PPC compartments, the residual cytoplasm, and um, long story short, we found uh, more than 1,000, in, in fact, in the case of the, the cryptophyte Giardia, more than 2,000. Um, proteins that were predicted to be encoded, encoded in the nucleus and targeted to that uh, subcellular compartment, the PPC. So rather more complex um, array of processes taking place there than we originally imagined. In the context of uh, this question of why nucleomorphs persist, we were interested in trying to assess whether genes and fragments of DNA were migrating regularly from the uh, nucleomorph genomes to the host nuclear genomes of these organisms. Uh, this was work that was done by Bruce Curtis, who was a, a PhD student of mine at the time. Um, he set out to characterize the various possible types of uh, endosymbiotic gene transfer events that can take place in a complex cell like this. Uh, new mites, mitochondrial DNA transfers, new peats, 
class to DNA migrations and new nums, for lack of a better word, um, fragments of nucleomorph DNA. So uh, this uh, was a lot of work and can be summarized very simply in this table, which is that a handful of instances of mitochondrial DNA integrants were determined or discovered in both nuclear genomes, but that we could not find a single instance of recent uh, transfer of DNA from the either the plastid or the uh, nucleomorph genomes of those two uh, cells. Now, we tried to make sense of this in the context of what has been referred to as the limited transfer window hypothesis of um, uh, Chris Howe, uh, Adrian Barbrook, and Saul Purton. Um, essentially, what this model posits is that there's a relationship between uh, the number of organelles that physically exist in a cell and the rate at which the frequency with which DNA has the potential to move from an organelle to a nuclear genome. Um, you can compare and contrast uh, very elegant lab experiments that were done in tobacco where you have uh, potentially hundreds of chloroplasts per cell and you find that DNA is transferring very, very readily and, and frequently over fine, uh, even over laboratory time, uh, time scales can be detected. Compare that to a system like Chlamydomonas where there is a single chloroplast per cell and uh, you cannot detect um, in, a, in a lab context migration of DNA at all. So it, it's interesting to us, at least in the context of cryptophytes and chloracnophytes, they generally have a single plastid slash nucleomorph um, complex per cell. And so we felt that these data were consistent with this kind of a model whereby there is only one organelle per cell and therefore um, organelle lysis is not likely to be a viable source of DNA to be moved into the, into the nuclear genome. Um, this probably uh, then explains why nucleomorphs happen to uh, still exist in these two groups. Um, it would appear, uh, in, uh, at the, the moment at least, that these genomes are frozen. Um, we do find many examples, I should point out, of uh, genes that have moved from uh, the endosymbiont nuclear genomes, the nucleomorphs, to the host nuclear genomes. There are plenty of algal-derived genes in these nuclear genomes, be clear on that point, but they are uh, what we think are more ancient transfers. On very fine scales, when we look at DNA-based analyses, we, we, we do not find examples of DNA migrating uh, over short evolutionary time scales. So that's the story of nucleomorphs and secondary plastid uh, bearing al algae. Uh, I'm going to contrast that now with, a, with the new system that I mentioned off the top. Um, when we think about eukaryote, eukaryote uh, secondary into symbiosis, uh, it, it invariably revolves around this question of acquired phototrophy. So the endosymbionts uh, that we've been talking about so far are algae. Um, and so it's obvious for us to think about uh, the potential selective advantages for establishing a stable secondary into symbiosis. Non-photosynthetic host acquiring a phototrophic alga, that makes um, intuitive sense to us. This particular system that I'll talk about now uh, does not make much sense, uh, as you'll see. This uh, is a, a group of amoebae um, belonging to the genus Paramoeba. They are marine uh, organisms marine uh, floating around and also in the sediments. They happen to, to cause uh, unfortunate diseases, uh, something called amoebic gill disease, which causes uh, serious problems in, in farmed salmon and, and other uh, creatures. They cause uh, die-offs in sea urchins and so forth. So there's a lot of um, uh, general interest in this particular organism. What uh, most biologists are not uh, interested in are the unusual eukaryotic endosymbionts that live inside them. Um, with this uh, light micrograph here, you can see two dots. One of them is, is the nucleus of the amoeba. The other is the uh, eukaryotic endosymbiont, which I'll now briefly describe to you. Um, this uh, is a, a close-up of a particular region of an amoeba cell. This is, uh, for context, this is the nucleus of the amoeba. This, uh, it doesn't look much like a, a standard eukaryotic cell, but it, but it is. Um, it's been known for many, many years, and people um, didn't really know what to make of it. It was called, and still is called, uh, the parasome. Um, what it actually is, is a 
uh, obligate endosymbiont that is a kinetoplastid protozoan, so it's related to things like trypanosoma and uh, bodosaltans and other uh, or related organisms. So these cells have uh, four genomes. Um, in the same way that the algae that I've uh, talked that I was talking about before have, um, and so we set out to uh, address this question of the trying to get our heads around the, the mystery of why this particular eukaryote, eukaryote uh, endosymbiosis exists. Uh, amoeba nucleus. We have a, a nucleus of the endosymbiont. This is the endosymbiont nucleus. This K refers to the large mass of mitochondrial DNA that. Um, obviously dominates the, the eukaryotic endosymbiont that you can see here, and there's also the mitochondrion of the host amoeba. On the right-hand side, you can see uh, a close-up of the uh, nucleus and the residual cytoplasm of the endosymbiont, which is essentially squashed around the side of this giant mitochondrion. So I'll cut a long story short by showing you this table, which summarizes um, some of the comparative genomic work that we've, what we've been doing. As I said, um, the endosymbiont, uh, which we refer to as Perkinsella species, um, is a kinetoplastid, and we've done uh, comparative analyses against two of the well-known um, uh, tri-trips. So this is Trypanosome brucei, uh, Leishmania major, and this is a free-living organism, Bodosaltans. So we've done a kind of a four-way comparison of the uh, various characters of these these genomes. So the first column here is the is the endosymbiont, the one that lives inside the amoeba. The genome, as far as we can tell, um, is well under 10 megabase pairs in size, um, probably around seven and a half. There's technical reasons for why we've not been able to come up with an exact number. I won't dwell on those today. Uh, we can predict uh, about 4,100 protein genes in the, the endosymbiont nuclear genome. You can see the numbers of genes compared to these other uh, related organisms. Um, there are quite a number of pseudogenes encoded or present in the, the endosymbiont nuclear genome, which is an interesting, uh, interesting from the perspective of reductive evolution. Uh, unlike many um, fully integrated organelles, certainly nucleomorphs do not have these. Uh, there's many mobile genetic elements that are found in these uh, in this particular genome, which is uh, interesting to us. And I'll summar summarize what we. Uh, basically see with this system uh, a very reduced but not dramatically reduced nuclear genome. We see pseudogenes, which is evidence of, I think, active reduction um, and something I not, don't have time to, to elaborate on. We do see some, not a lot, but some uh, endosymbiotic gene transfer. So there are genes in the amoeba nuclear genome that are of endosymbiont origin. Those genes are expressed um, and they very, very clearly are of um, kinetoplastid origin. One uh, interesting cell biological observation which has really started to drive this project forward is, uh, comes from this image. This is from the fine work of uh, Ivan uh, Fiala in, in Julius Lukasz's lab. Um, this is the endosymbiont for context. You can see these uh, light uh, blobs just in, inside the outer membrane of the uh, uh, endosymbiont. This is a close-up of that particular region. We interpret these uh, little uh, vesicles, these blobs, to be examples of uh, the endosymbiont uh, carrying out endocytosis, so the process of bringing in material from the cytoplasm of the amoeba. And I should point out that there is uh, the outer membrane of this endosymbiont is derived from the endosymbiont. It's not of host cell origin as it is in some of these other, other algae. So this has uh, prompted a lot of uh, debate and discussion amongst uh, the, the research teams involved in this. Uh, many of them um, worked on closely with the Lucas lab. Um, Ugo Sansi, a postdoc of mine who's at this meeting, uh, has set out to uh, try and grapple with this problem by looking at the the uh, endosymbiont nuclear genome. What we do find is the minimal components of some sort of an endocytotic uh, apparatus. So it's quite clear that the endosymbiont is perfectly capable of carrying out endocytosis, and we think that the, the uh, TEM data is consistent with, with that as well. Um, exactly what is going on there is uh, much less 
uh, easy to get one's head around. Um, so I'm going to make a plug for Ugo's poster, which uh, you can visit and, and talk to him about a little bit later. Um, he's carried out metabolic reconstructions of the amoeba. By the way, the amoeba has about 20,000 uh, genes, so it's a normal amoeba in, in many ways. Um, and looking, comparing that, those metabolic profiles to the uh, those that are predicted from the endosymbiont. Um, one of the intriguing uh, leads that we're following is up is that there may be some uh, amino acid uh, biosynthetic processes that are provided by the amoeba that lack, or that are not uh, being carried out by the endosymbiont. And so this could explain, at least uh, to a certain approximation, why it is that this eukaryote is taking material in from the amoeba. But we have, uh, the short answer is that we have no uh, concrete leads at this point. So hopefully I've given you some sort of a, a general overview of the, the types of interactions that we see when we're talking about eukaryote, eukaryote endosymbioses. Obviously the algal systems uh, are very ancient and as you can see very uh, advanced in terms of uh, the, the systems we're using to study it. Uh, we've got a good uh, handle on those questions. Uh, at the very far end, other end of the continuum are the uh, examples like I described um, uh, where we have uh, an obligate endosymbiont um, that is in fact not a, a phototroph or anything like that, yet it seems to be a, a permanent resident inside the amoeba cytoplasm. And there's many examples in between there. Um, I've thought of this and described it as a continuum, but it may in fact not be a continuum. I think one of the things we want to learn and we, we uh, crave to understand is what, what, uh, are, the, what are the universal principles uh, driving this transition from endosymbiont to uh, fully fledged organelle and, and the eukaryotic uh, eukaryote, eukaryote endosymbiotic events is one, just one angle that we can use to try and grapple with that uh, problem. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank these people and thank you for your attention. <laughs>